Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me this Friday, a part, spending part of your Friday with me. I'm Greg Swartz. I'm the big man half of the big man WeDram. This here is the WeDram. We'll get to more of that in a little bit. Um, and uh, this week, I'm really excited. As some of you may have noticed over the last few weeks and the upcoming weeks, not exclusively, but we're trying to talk to some of our friends who are going to be featured in the, the new independent bottling film. Um, and over the course of the last year or so, we've managed to interview a huge cross section of people from the world of the, the, the butlers of the world, not all in Scotland either. And uh, it's been a, a really exciting d deep dive for us as whiskey nerds to sort of get to know them and get to know their whiskeys. And one of the people that I immediately took a liking to when we met in Germany a few years ago, literally we met days before the pandemic began, uh, is, is my guest today. He's Kenny McDonald. So I'm going to say, please welcome Kenny. Hello, Hi. how are you folks? Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, it was absolutely my pleasure, mate. My pleasure. It's funny. It's been a while since I've spoken to you, but I feel like I have because I was just... Uh, editing footage with you in it with the uh, for the independent bottling film we were just working on you last week and and this is why you drink having to listen <laughs> to me edit me actually you know what that's one of the good things at least you can edit me when it's live yeah. you're stuck with me yeah no it's it was great your interview is great because uh you know one of the things we're trying to do in that film is to create a really good cross section of different bottlers that are big and small old and new um, east and west within Scotland without and you know um, you know getting to talk to you was was awesome because I think that you know you guys are relatively young but uh, yeah yeah uh, you've, you've, you've kind of made a splash already and I met you as part of Jim McEwen and friends so that's right you know, yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah it's um, Jim's trouble wherever he goes he just drags people together he's, he's good that way I, I don't think he can help himself um, no no, when, when you've retired five times, <laughs> there's an issue somewhere. You know, it's funny. Um, uh, his daughter told me that when she was growing up, it never dawned on her as a kid that Isla was a fairly remote place because three or four nights a week, there were like groups of tourists over for dinner or whiskey collectors from Hong Kong or a group of people from South Africa or a bunch of Americans or whatever, you know. Yeah, I, I was the center of the world. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. In our interview with you, you mentioned you were, you talked about you know getting mentorship from different people throughout the industry, and, and but I don't know how you met Jim. I just met you through Jim, but I don't know how you met him. Do you know, I met Jim. This is years and years ago. Uh, we'd both been working in Switzerland, but different jobs, and there had been a, a, a mess with the flight leaving. We were really late leaving. Uh, we were on the same plane, but we didn't know each other. Uh, I knew who he was, but I, I didn't know him. Uh, and then by the time we get into Schiphol, we'd made up good time. We thought, we're going to make a plane, all good. And then just into a holding pattern for the next age. So we missed our flight and we had to rebook. So we went to the, the transfer and Jim standing in the queue in front of me. And we were in that transfer queue for about three hours. So the two of us just had a right good natter. Managed to get our flight changed and it had to go via somewhere crazy in the south of England. Uh, and the girl gives us a bit of paper. Use that. You don't need a boarding pass. That's that's how you got on your plane. Wonderful. Thank you. So I took Jim to the lounge and we had a drink and we had a natter. All good. I said, oh, here, come on. Let's get to this flight, Jim. So we get to the plane and the girl at this flyby desk goes, that's not a boarding pass. I'm like, I know it's not a boarding pass. The girl at transfer said, this is all we need. That's not a boarding pass. I'm like, this is all we need. So she's not letting us on the plane. So I end up saying to Jim, look, you wait here. I'll run back and get us sorted. Ran back. Same girl at transfer. Livid. I'm coming with you. Right, great. So she storms back down. By the time we get there, there's not a soul there. Everybody's boarded. And the girl says to me, oh, listen, I was wrong. You can get on the plane with that. I went, wonderful, brilliant. Eh, except the plane, the plane's already left the pier. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, the plane's left. I'm like, ah. And I'm looking about. I said, eh, where's the gentleman I was with? 
Oh, we told him just to get on the plane and wait for you. Like, you are <laughs> joking. So Jim got on the plane and I didn't. Uh, I, this is a, it's been a running joke, this, because the girl managed to squeeze me onto a Glasgow flight right to the death. Business class, everything. Brilliant. I land in Glasgow. I phoned Jim to see how he's getting on. He got as far as Exeter or wherever he was going and the flight home got cancelled. So he was stuck in England and I was at home. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I met Mr. McEwen. Uh, wow. Well met. He's a fantastic guy, as you know. I do indeed. And you know, it's funny, you're the second person in a row to tell me a story about meeting Jim that is about airports. Because over the when I was I was in Scotland in June when I saw you, and uh, we were on Isla and we had dinner with Billy Stitchell from Kalila. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And he told me that he and Jim got stuck together in the when Terminal Five just opened at Heathrow, like the day or the week it opened. I guess the whole computers crashed and they were there for hours and hours and hours and wound it's up becoming one, pals because they were stuck together with everyone. It's one of the joys of living in airports, Greg. You know, I'm in airports more than I'm in my own home, so. That if you're ever going to meet somebody, if anyone's out there is ever going to bump into me, it's going to be in an airport, I can guarantee it. <laughs> you just got back, right? You were just a, yeah. abroad just I'm now. Always, I'm always just getting back. <laughs> I was in Poland last week. Really good. Warsaw Whiskey Festival. Um, very, very well organized festival. I was really happy with the way it went. Held in Legia Warsaw's football stadium. So the master classes were all in the executive boxes. It was very posh. It was, it was good. I enjoyed it. But I did have the scariest bedroom in the world. Polish hotels are either incredibly good or incredibly bad. Uh, so I don't know if you saw it on Facebook, Greg, but uh, I will quite happily share with the world my wonderful relaxing bedroom <laughs> How are you making like out in that, folks? It's like you were in uh, inside of a LSD well, that, that's room. A, that, that's exactly what I said. It's like a twelve-year-old on acid for a decade. <coughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was a good show. Other than the fact you had to sleep with a welder's mask on, it was a good show. So home this week. I was meant to be in Aberdeen tomorrow, but we've had horrendous storms here. Uh, and the whole of the northeast is basically underwater at the moment. Uh, so it's been cancelled. Well, postponed uh. for another day. Um, and we'll, we'll make it back up there another time, but not, not this time, I'm afraid. You know, um, it just dawned on me when you said that. Last weekend, I was just going to say, as if this was a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It, it was the same thing. Our film was just screened at the Warsaw Whiskey Festival What's last that? weekend. Yeah. I had no idea. We uh, we had to get um, we added uh, Polish subtitles, and oh, that's really? we were we were working on it up to the last minute to get po Polish subtitles added. Super. So, bit by bit, we're adding. Anytime we we get an opportunity to screen the film in another language region, we add that language. And so we're actually now we're working on Spanish because it looks like we're going to be going to Panama in uh, February. Funnily enough, I just opened up Panama. Uh, our first ever order for Jamor came in from Panama two days ago. So wow. I'm really, really excited to see how that's going to work out for us. Um, it would be an interesting place to get out to have a wee look at as well. Well, so, come in February. The, uh, do, you, do, you, do you know Los Wiscochos? No. Los Wiscochos is the biggest Spanish language whiskey channel on YouTube. All right. Okay. And uh, it's, it's whiskey reviews. And the guys who run it, they're having an anniversary party for the club from all over Latin America. They're all going to Panama in February. So yeah. that's where we're, I think we're going to be there. Um, they're huge. And uh, I live in Los Angeles. I don't, I speak restaurant Spanish, but I don't speak any kind of practical Spanish, but I know lots of people who do. So we're working on Spanish subtitles right now. I, I genuinely struggle with English, Greg. Uh, <laughs> anything else is just not going to happen for me at all. I'm afraid. Um, very much Victoria as a linguist, not me. So I'll leave that side to her. Uh, and I'm quite fortunate where, obviously, just about everywhere you go, someone can speak English. So it gets you out of a lot of problems. And 
even if I'm somewhere where it's not easy to find someone that speaks English, nine times out of ten, Victoria can speak the language. So that's mm. the beauty of marrying somebody that used to be a, a translator for the EU. So quite good. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, my I've been studying German for two years, but I'm I'm pretty I'm not, I'm not it's not a natural skill of mine, you know. Um, you know, it's uh, something I'm developing you know, bit by bit because you know I think maybe I mentioned to you we're making a film about Bavarian beer. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, and we're done shooting it now, but we're 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 editing it now, and uh, so we did the interviews either I did it with Udo. And he helped me. He would do the translate. If, if the person didn't speak English, he would do the interview in German and we'll translate it later. And if not, yeah, I would do the interview in English. So, oh, he's a nice big lad, dude. He's a good guy. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And he and I, he's been producing this with us. It was his idea. When I met you, is he was sort of pitching us and then he he sold me. You know, he just he just filled me full of beer and then convinced me. And uh, no, it's been a wonderful experience. The, the, the things that happen to us, it's a disaster, isn't it? It's my only German I've got is. Um, I gross a beer better. Zwei gross a beer better. <laughs> Drei gross a beer. So as I can order big beers, I'm a happy man. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Seidler is a regular beer, and a Mass is a one liter beer. Uh, mass, that's a mass, mass, yeah, yeah. And that's what you need is that big hand or a liter, isn't it? It's yeah. Liter. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny when we were filming it, uh, we hired a gaffer in Germany. Who speaks, speaks fluent English and German, and, and every day, I would just walk up to him and whisper something from my Duolingo German lessons that was completely, <laughs> like, "How much are the strawberries today?" Uh, you know, and every he would look for a second, and he would always burst out laughing. It was just became this running joke between us. And every now and then, I send him a text with just something about, "Is my train still on time?" Perfect. Uh, for some reason, I did Duolingo German to try to get a little bit. And all it kept telling me was how to order bread and water. I thought, what kind of restaurant do you think I'm going to in Germany? And I thought, this is terrible. Uh, and I, I just gave up on it. I'm, it's, I'm too long in the tooth, Greg. If I was a young man, maybe I might stand a chance. But well, as a crumbling old wreck, nah. <laughs> One of my one of my German language sentences that comes up all the time, which is very funny, is, oh, no, he's in love with my girlfriend. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and a friend of mine told me that one of the ones he got was, uh, which one of the children is bloody? Like, what? <laughs> uh, what Duolingo at all? <laughs> I don't know. I, it's there's a dark side to Duolingo. <laughs> um, hey, so uh, so our our pal James DiGiulio said, um, great, Greg. Now I have to search for Dram more. Well, you're going to be searching a bit there. James, at least is when you're in the state side. And that's what I wanted, one of the things I wanted to talk about with Kenny, because, you know, I, I, most of the people who watch this know that this isn't one market. This is 50 markets. And it's, it's, it's a, you know, a, an absolute maze of, uh, but, but, you know, what, if you'd like to share with people, because I think most of the people watching are probably in the States right now. Um, yeah. Tell us what your plans are, because I know I'd love to get myself some, because I've had them every time I go to Scotland, I go out of my way to drink around more. Yeah, a good but, man. You're Keeping me afloat, Greg. <laughs> yes, uh, probably. As as things stand at the moment, um, we don't have distribution stateside, uh, and it's it's slightly harder for us because you're you're almost dealing with every state as a separate market, rather than finding something which is kind of pan American. Uh, and for us, the the it's a very different um, setup to the way that we would distribute alcohol in Europe. Um, Victoria is speaking to a couple of people at the moment, so we are kind of trying to creak that door open a little bit. And I think once we manage to break into one or two states and we understand ourselves what the process is a wee bit better than we do at the moment, then we can really start to pick up. One of the problems that we face is such a big market. And as a bottler of single casks, we're only really getting maybe 270, 300 bottles from every cask. And we've got a lot of different marketplaces that we've got to kind of distribute these, you know, sure. uh, casks around. So I think taking over, you know, breaking into a market the size of the States 
what we'll really have to do is, is look long and hard about doing bespoke out terms purely for the American market. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, instead of splitting it over different countries, I can split it over different states. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and work it that way. I know some people do like stuff with clubs, you know, because they'll do like the Chicago is a big market or DC because of the Jack Rose or, or, um, a couple of weeks ago, my guest on here was Holly Sidewand and, you know, she owns a whiskey shop in upstate New York and, and Holly, I never knew this, but she said, because she's saying this as a retailer in New York, she said a lot of independent bottlers get stuck in California because, mm -hmm. well, uh, what, you know, I didn't realize this because I benefit from it. So I don't see it. I don't see the privilege. But you got to figure one out of nine Americans is a Californian. That's how that's the population differential. Seriously? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So and California has really pretty cool liquor laws and tons of independent liquor importers. So you add all that together. A lot of she said a lot of like single casts will get to California. And if that retail, if that importer can sell that all in California, why would he or she bother going to Nevada or Arizona or, yeah, you know, yeah. if they can if they can move it all here, they do. And so it gets stuck here. And so. You know, there's a huge selection of whiskeys, independent whiskeys, uh, independently bottled whiskeys, small companies that I can get that I can't get when I go back east or not as easily. I mean, that's interesting. That I wasn't aware of. Um, I know, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange setup because, as you're saying, you know, California's got relatively, you know, liberal alcohol laws that other states certainly don't have. And mm -hmm. you have to deal with very much different rules state to state rather than oh well we just do xyz and they're in um but we're learning curve for us but it's far too good a marketplace for us not to want to get into um definitely we, we do want to get in there uh it's just finding the right people and that's key is, is spending a bit of time doing a good bit of research to make sure that when you do get that distributor it's going to be the right person that's looking after your brand in a new market. Uh, and it would also then give me the great excuse to come over the water. Uh, I've been to Canada, but I've never been to the States. Of all the countries I've travelled around, it's the one that's missing at the moment. So any excuse, I will be across the water, that's for sure. Cool. Well, I, I'll be there for the whiskey and for you. Good luck. <laughs> uh, you know, so I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, so you know, which is the, which has the strictest liquor laws or definitely top three, bottom three, whatever in the country. So, you know, there's a no shortage of uh, crap that I know companies have to jump through because it's all owned by the state. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, it's in Pennsylvania, it's the, sort of the equivalent of like uh, getting your driver's license. Like they're, they're state employees. When I was a right. kid, they used to, they used to all, all the employees, they, they, they've, they've made it seem fun. Now they've um, now they've, they changed. It used to just say like liquor on the wall, like it was just like you know a, a government office. Now it says like fine wine and good spirits, and they used to wear shirts and ties, like See civil it. servants. Yeah, and now yeah. now it's now it's much more. Now they spend a little money on decor, but not a whole lot, um, and and the prices are terrible. Uh, so yeah, I so make fun not, of my friends. Uh, you're not gonna get that boutique feel when you go into the store then. No, no. But I mean, my, my wife's from New York, or her family all lives in New York. And when I go there, New York is great too. You know, so there's, and Holly's store is in New York, which is the best whiskey shop I've been into in the States. Um, I'll have to have a look out for that, actually. I'll have a nosy. Uh, it's somewhere that is, you know, I think probably next year, all going to plan, we should have our first tentative step into the American market. Uh, and I know that for some people, because I've got quite a few friends in the States who are part of our kind of cask clan, where they've bought casks from us for, mainly for fun, but uh, as an investment tool. But the beauty of that is um, I get to buy, I get first bite of the cherry when they want to sell their cask. So it works well for me. And I've got a lot of clients now in the States, um, mainly New York, but all the way down to there's a lad in Austin in Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've got I've got a lot of folk over there who it'd be really nice to catch up with. All I've ever done, speak to them. You know that we were doing today, 
and it would be lovely to get the opportunity to actually sit down and talk with them. Uh, that's you know, it's funny because I've started well. Uh, it, it, I, we could, I could go off on that for all day long, but about casks and stuff like that with, you know, because I want to, what I want to do is talk a little bit about your process of, you know, you were a, a smaller bottler, a newer bottler. And yeah. I have to think I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I have to think that you, the, the whiskeys in those bottles really reflect your taste and your wife's taste probably. Right. To, right? to, to the degree, Greg, to the degree, I think it's one of the things that, Certainly, when we started, that that was very true. Um, but the more the more you start to build, the more that you realise that you've got to make whiskey for everybody, not just for yourself. You know, so if if I'm looking at certain finishes on a dram, I, I'm quite partial to simple refill bourbon casks. I, I I think it really allows the spirit to sing through the oak. And the one thing I've, I'm a really kind of not happy with is sometimes when people finish their whiskies, they do it way too heavy-handed, and it wipes out that classic distillery style that comes through the whisky. But at the same time, I also know that people like some of these great big heavy flavors. So you've kind of got to make you've you've got to be all things to all men, so that mm -hmm. you've got an offering there that no matter what your flavour or your, your kind of palate preferences, there's going to be something on offer that works for you. Um, but yeah, I, I was very guilty at the beginning of, of making everything to suit me, forgetting that I'm not the one that's going to be drinking it all. Although yeah. I do a damn good effort. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it's nice to spread the love sometimes. Um, hey, before I lose this, this is here. This is some practical, you know. Uh, so our pal at, at, at Donner Pass Whiskey says K and L Wine, which the retailer is just down the street from me. I was there yesterday. Really good place to start. Big independent bottle customer. They they definitely do. It. I mean, they have tons of Hunter Lang, Douglas Lang. Yeah, maybe not quite so much Gordon and McPhail, but uh, yeah, they definitely do. I think, but um, so I was hold on. I was there yesterday picking this up. I had it uh, at the weekend uh, when I was in Poland. Eric. I've not had it yet. It's, yeah. But for a very young whiskey, it's impressive, Greg. Um, I was quite happy with it. I, I bought uh, a couple of bottles of it when it was released a couple of weeks ago. But again, I, I've not opened mine either. Uh, and it just so happened when we were working in Warsaw, the lad right across from me had the Herrick. And I thought, oh, I need to try that. So I went over and had a wee, a wee look at it. Um, gently peated, not anything, nowhere near your kind of Lagavulin and Lafroig levels, nothing like that. Really gentle, nice, easy-going dram. So it's still very young. But for me, it's always good to look at these things at that age because it gives you a really good indication where it's going to go. And mm -hmm. that for it's a really good start, put it that way. And am I am I right in remembering that maybe you're uh, you're you're not a, a herak yourself, but you're half Lewis. a one? Oh, Lewis. Lewis. Okay, Lewis. Above, uh, <laughs> technically the same island, but there is a, a kind of an imaginary border, and obviously the herak are the poor of cousins to us wonderful folk. Uh, and there's always this kind of back and forth is well natured tongue in cheek about who who's better than who. Uh, hmm. the one thing I can certainly say, uh, having drank Arvin Jarach from Lewis, the Herich are well ahead of us when it comes to whiskey, because that is not a pleasant drop. Hmm. I've and not I, had it. I know it, but I've not had it. I, I, I never speak ill of any distillery, but that is just not good. And it's only seven miles away from our village. So that should be my local dram. But, no, nah, it's not good. So the Herak are miles ahead of us when it comes to whiskey. You know, I've never been to Harris or Lewis. Um, oh, I've, you've got I've, to go. I've, I've, want to, I've always wanted to. I also want to go to Shetland. And I've never been to Orkney. No, neither um, have I. Fair enough. Uh, it's one of these funny things that islanders in Scotland have a tendency just to stick to their own island. You never really go visit other people's 
And when my dad was still alive, I, I was going to, where was I going? Aaron. And he just happened to mention, I've never been to Aaron. I'm like, Dad, it's only 40 minutes in the ferry. He went, yeah, yeah, I've never been. And it's a stunningly beautiful island. Like, you've never been to Isla, Dad? Nah, I've not been there either. What about Mull? Nah, I've not been there either. Ah. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're bad for that. You know, you just keep going home and that's it. You stick to your yeah. island. Nothing else. So I've kind of broken the mould a little bit with that one. Uh, well, which I like the book. Um, I've been to Scotland. I think this last trip, I think it was my 17th trip to Scotland. And, um, uh, but, but I've never, <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, you know, I got hooked early and, uh, you know, but then, uh, but it's funny when I was an exchange student in Glasgow, I never left Glasgow. Loch Lomond was as far as I got. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, I mean, Glasgow's a great city. There's, there's so much to do, so much to enjoy about Glasgow. You're quite happy to stay. And I had a very limited amount of money, and that money needed to go into whiskey and beer. Of course it did, yeah. You've, you've uh, got to prioritize, Greg. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, the uh, the student union had 99 pence pints. Where did you study? In Glasgow, Caledonia. Okay, oh, so I've never been in that uni, uh, in that student uni. Uh, well, we would we would a lot of times go to the Strathclyde Uni because it was well, their, their student was, union was better. Yeah, that was mine, and that was a great student union. Yeah, you could hear uh, the music outside of it before you'd even go in the building. Right? Oh, the place was bouncing. Nobody ever studied; they just went to Strathclyde so they could get into that union. Uh, so, so many bars was what three bars in the nightclub. Yeah, not bad at you, all. Do you know what's funny is uh, one time we were in the Glasgow student union and i the the jukebox would have an hours long queue of music lined up in it and my pal and i were looking at what we wanted to play and we'd had quite a few pints and one of us i don't remember who probably me slipped and bumped the plug and it unplugged the jukebox oh so we, so we plugged it back in as quick as we could and just started hitting numbers because then people started showing up wondering what had happened and we just sort of were like well, i don't know and then split because i <laughs> <laughs> That was oh, my. Uh, that's when we that stopped hanging around in that one. one piece. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, well, you know, it's funny talking about the islands. Is uh, um, I'm working on something. I, I'm not really ready to go into it in detail yet because I just don't have enough of a. Uh, I will have to be by next weekend because my guest one week from today is Rob McAker from from oh, Brooklady cool. Distillery. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know if you know Rab, but Rab and I are working on a little project together that we think would be cool. And it's all about the Hebrides. It's not about whiskey. It's a little bit about whiskey, but it's not built around whiskey. Right. Um, right. When, when's that, Greg? It'll be like, he's my guest next week. He's you That's... next week. Right. I will wear my next week, Germany. Oh, fine. So I'll miss it. But I, can I get it on a... Yeah, it, it stays on here and on the Facebook group and it stays on YouTube. This stays right. forever. And now we have a deal with Whiskey Network. We're sharing this feed to the Whiskey Network. Dot com, and there and they'll this all this is live on Whiskey Network right now, and it will stay there as well. So, brilliant, brilliant. Um, well, but yeah, we're. I'm 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 developing a, an entire new project just as an excuse so I can go to more Hebridean islands. Craig, you're always you're always <laughs> doing something, mate. But anything that brings you back over here, you're happy with. It's not a problem. Well, so the next thing that will bring me there is going to be the independent bottling thing. And, and that's yeah, one of the yeah. things that, and, uh, you know, so the, just in case you may know this already, and some people watching this might know this, but the idea behind this was kind of a joke where we shot a ton of, we spent a week at Gordon McPhail when we were making the original film. And then we used maybe four or five minutes about them in, in the film. And we were joking with each other. We're like, oh, we have enough film here for a whole other story. And then, I was talking to Guy and I said, you know, I, th I think we could make an entire other film about independent bottling. Just, you know, based on this interview, it, it, I knew there wasn't enough there, but the, f the, the spine was there, you know? Yeah. And then, and then during the pandemic, Guy and I started, you know, really kind of whipping this together and started, he started doing interviews in Scotland in my absence when I couldn't go. And I do them when I can do them. I've done a bunch here. Um, and then he does them there. And, and so we're sort of co-making this film together. And, we're now editing it and it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely deep nerd. It's not, it's not going to, it's, it won't have the broad appeal. Like, cause people just, it, 
it's hard to even the whole first scene is explaining what an independent bottler is, you know. Uh, yeah, because it's kind of a unique thing, you know. It's oh, very um, much. yeah. I've been looking for the perfect analogy for what to compare to in another industry. I've got a couple of ones, but none of them is perfect. It's it's a really strange concept, and I can't really think off the top of my head anybody else that would take something that's been produced and tweak it the way that we do with, with whiskey. I, I can't think of anything like that, Greg. Uh, so here, here's the closest I've got. Uh, aftermarket tuners for cars. Um, there's Now here in the States, there's a company called Celine and right. also Shelby, and they take Fords. They take Ford Mustangs, and then they make a Celine Ford. And they're a trusted partner. Ford lets them keep the badging on Ford. It's oh, still yeah. a Ford Mustang, but then they'll do all kinds of premiumization, optimize it under the hood, and also with some of the extras and the, the, the you know. And I know Mercedes Benz has AMG, which they now they own, but they didn't used to own it. It used mm -hmm. to actually be a partner of theirs that would just sort of you know customize their cars. Cool. That's, the, that's the best I got. That's the best I got. Uh, well, it's it, it, it is a very strange concept when you think about it because we're taking liquid from a distillery who have basically molded the spirit into their own shape. You know, that, that's what signifies one specific distillery. That characterizes who they are. And then they let us play about with it and change it completely. Which, uh, when you think about it, is a kind of strange concept. But it also allows them to have their spirit showcased in so many different ways. That, especially if you're concentrating on a core range of 10, 12, 15, 18, 21 year old whiskey. You can't really be crazily inventive and, and adventurous. You've got to do what everybody expects you to do. So by allowing us to play with them, you you get to showcase the spirit in completely different ways. But that then has a massive, for me anyway, I, I think it's massively important that I show that spirit that utmost respect because if I don't then I could be damaging their reputation. If, if I make a bad job of say uh, Craig Elliki, for example and someone tries it and they've never had Craig Elliki before I've made a mess of it. Do I get the blame? Well, in the short term yeah, but in the long term it's Craig Elliki that gets the blame because if someone says years down the line listen, I've got a Craig Elliki would you like to try it? No I've tried it before, it's no good so it's massively incumbent on us as independent ballers to make sure that when we put that spirit out there for people to buy, it has to be the very best that we can do because it's not our name, or it is our name on the label, but it's not just our name. It's their reputation on the line as well. So we've got to strive to make sure that we get it just on the button. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's funny because I, the, I can give you a personal example of that. I, I don't. It's been years and years, but the first time I ever heard, let alone tasted, of a Glen Talkers was an independent bottle. Yeah, I never knew what that was, and I, was, and I remember looking at this bottle, thinking, hmm, I don't know what this is. I don't remember. Yeah, I do. If now that I think of it, I do remember who the bottler was. But, I, but, but in that, either case, if I had disliked it, which I actually quite liked it, you know, if I disliked it, I would have never sought it out again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the flip side is Dal Ewan. Um, I, I really love independently bottled Dal Ewans. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very rare as official bottling. So, you know, I've had yeah. them all, all of the ones I have. I have two, two bottles of them. Well, three. I have an official bottling and then I have two independent bottlings right now. And I, and I, I discovered those through independent bottlers too. Had I not liked it, I probably would have never gotten the other ones. Yeah. Well, that's it. It's, I think for us, one of the things that kind of keeps us, not just that I'm more, but independent bottlers in general, really striving to make sure that we get it right, is our reputation is only as good as our last bottling. The minute you put something out there that's poor, then folk will walk away from you. They won't come back. Any Anyone can sell a bottle of whiskey. Getting someone to come back and buy more, that's the trick. And if you give them 100% quality every time, 
then they're going to come back over and over and over. The minute you drop the ball, you're only as good as your last ball. It doesn't matter if you've had 10, 12, 20 years of incredible drams. The minute you give them something poor, they're not going to rush back and buy the next one. So it's, it's really important that we keep that standard as high as is humanly possible. Do you think that after a long time, like uh, say a customer you have who's been buying every release you do, they're buying at least one or two bottles, every one. Yep. At a certain point, you probably have earned yourself enough uh, credibility to to you could make a misstep, and they'll they'll say, "Okay, I don't like that one," but though, but uh, you know, you still have to get over whatever that hump is. I don't. It's probably different for each person. Yeah, possibly. Uh, but should I expect that they come back and buy again? No. Yeah, yeah. If I don't drop the ball, then I'm going to be very disappointed if somebody walks away from us. Can you think? Well, I've done everything I can possibly do. To make sure that the spirit going into your glass is as good as it's going to get. So why would you turn your back on me? That that would annoy me. Mm -hmm. But if I did drop the ball and someone was to walk away from me or, or even cut me some slack, I would still be very, very disappointed in myself because I've let that customer down. And it's the one thing that I'll say in every master class, every festival, whatever we're doing. Dramore's not a brand. Dramore is a promise from me hmm. to my customers that what is in that bottle is exceptional. If it's not exceptional, I will not bottle it. I'll sell it to somebody else. They might bottle it like that. That's fine. That's up to them. But if it is not exceptional, it is not going in a Dramore bottle. And that then instills genuine trust and people, when when they see that bottle on the shelf, they know they're going to get something good. I can't always tick the box for your favourite flavour profile, but I can definitely make sure that whatever you're getting is top quality. So that's that's the key. Graham, how are we? Hello, Graham. I just wanted to throw that up there because I know he was rushing. He wanted to join us, but he was on the train from Campbellton. It's a long sounds like. It sounds like the name of a song. It does a wee bit, yeah, I agree. <laughs> now, I've got to warn you, I, as you know, Greg, before we came on air, I have had massive technical difficulties because my laptop wouldn't open things up. So I've had to plug my iPad in. And StreamYard is a greedy sod. And even though it's plugged in, the battery's still going down. <laughs> so what may happen, if I suddenly vanish, give me a couple of minutes, I'll find something else and I'll reappear. Well, for what it's worth, we've only got 20 more minutes max, and these are as long as they are. They're not as long. There's no set time. 3%. Ah. So, uh, <laughs> a funny feeling, and we started off at 17%. So this is this is a hungry animal, this stream here. What I might try and do is log, I... in, log in my phone at the moment, and then I can kill this and come on with my phone. Sorry. If you... Cool. That's all, it's okay. Do you have, um, if, if you're using the small plug, like a phone plug to charge your iPad, that's probably why. Because, you know, your iPad has that bigger plug. Good but the, point. But the, Good point. The Wii one think, will do it. Thank McDonald's. Um, uh, um, Give me two seconds. I'll get the boss. Yeah. And get the board me. Oh. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'll show people what I'm drinking while you're gone. Who's so I'm drinking. Uh, I don't, I, as I said earlier, folks, I don't have any of Kenny's whiskeys here because they're not for sale in the States yet. So I'm drinking Ralphie's last bottling, which is this Kalila, which has, uh, I won't bore you. But it has an insanely long uh, label, uh, but it's a 10 year old Kalila, nine years in a Pomerol Barrique and one year in an Oloroso Hogshead. Um, and it's delicious. But before that, I had this, which is a privately bottled Thing that a friend of mine bottled here, which is from a sneaky space eye that may have the word farkless in its name, but uh, may not. But uh, so two very different whiskeys, but um, they're the first uh, uh, whiskeys I've had in in a couple days. I, I had a sore throat earlier this week and wasn't drinking. Um, the uh, so uh, James uh, DiGiulio says, uh, the one week in Campbellton. So are you going to the Springbank Academy, James, or are you doing the Isla Whiskey Academy? I see both there, and I'm not sure what you're doing. Or maybe you're going to be... At what point does that count as being an exchange student um, who's taking whiskey master classes all the time? Uh, 
but the um i'm 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 uh oh uh graham fraser has that one the the ralphie one it's a lovely dram i have to say um, you you hard push to get Kalila wrong you know i've i've always found the the consistency coming out of Kalila is superb you know i think people kind of look down their nose at it because it's not that beautiful whitewashed distillery with the the name along the side that that, that classic isla it's a pretty bloody awful looking building you know 1960s monstrosity but the quality of the spirit is second to none you know that's really yeah. good quality. i love Kalilas, really do so we, we we were talking recently on here about there's a sense some people look down their nose at Kalila because they think, oh, it's just a com- most of it's just a component for Johnny Walker Black. But that's not fair to Kalila because Kalila is doing what it's meant to do. Yeah. You, sh- you shouldn't you you shouldn't think of your Toyota as a failed Porsche. <laughs> you know, it wasn't supposed to be a Porsche. It was built to be a Toyota. But the same can be put to, you know, Glen Turret just being a component of what was Grouse, or anything that Link would go into whatever blend they want to throw it into. Um, I've just bottled a Manachmore, which is sublime, absolutely beautiful, just refilled bourbon, really delicate, river flowers. It's just a phenomenally good dram. And none of that gets bottled. It all goes into blending. And you know, I think people can be, I think as whiskey drinkers, we can be phenomenally judgmental and we can maybe slightly toffee nose about things, you know, and it's good for us to wind our neck back in and go, actually, this does exactly what it says on the tin. Mm-hmm. And Kalila is one of those, you know, I, I've, I don't think I've ever had a bad Kalila. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I totally agree. Um, Graham Fraser has a question for us. Any thoughts on the unpeated Kalila? I love it. I had one, Victoria bought me one a few years ago, and I'd never had unpeated Kalila before. And I thought, well, that surely, what's the point of having an unpeated Kalila? I didn't get it at first. I just thought, what are they trying to do here? It was out of this world. I loved it. I demolished that bottle in the space of a week. Go um. On. I've I've had it once myself, and that was I mentioned at the beginning of this having dinner with Billy Stitchell when I was, yeah. and and so it, a lot of the unpeated Kalila, a bunch of them are released as Stitchell Reserve, and 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 he brought a bottle to that dinner, and I'd had it there. That's the first time I'd ever had it, and I loved it. Although I have to admit, it's hard to when you're I'm literally in the Port Askeg Hotel, um, yeah. having dinner with Billy Stitchell. I'm having an amazing meal. I'm having an amazing conversation. And this is this whiskey that's named after this guy that I'm talking to. It's hard not to love the whiskey. Like you're, 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 you're predisposed to liking, it. you know, you have to, you have to, there's something sadly wrong if you're not enjoying that. Yeah. It was was, the whole evening was just absolutely amazing. It was the trip we just did in June. It was one of the dinners we arranged. I said, I've actually not been to Isla since Fesh, uh, which was, it's only the second time ever I've gone over during Fesh. And, I mean, for those of you who um, I've never been across, Isla is an island only holds 3,000 people. That's, that's a population. During Fish Isle, which is the Isla Whiskey Festival, that goes up to 15,000 people. And it's utter insanity. But it is, honestly, it's the biggest week-long party you'll ever see. Um, there's a few sore-looking heads on the ferry coming back across the water at the end of Fish. Uh and I guess, Graham, you're right, Manachmore is an equally ugly distillery. I will give you that. Uh, but we went this year, and for the first time, I wasn't aware there was an independent bottlers section to Fish Ale. Mm-hmm. One day at Ramsey Hall, and we were invited across. And I don't normally, I'm not a big supporter of our own whiskey festivals in Scotland because they are massively that, that some of the bad behaviour is ridiculous is people have paid £40 for a ticket and they're going to drink £400 worth of whiskey you know it's very much the last man standing approach and unlike all the festivals in the rest of Europe we don't pay for our drams at festivals 
You pay for your entry ticket, you get an empty glass, a bottle of water, and a map. And they go, go and help yourself. So basically all we're doing is pouring really good quality alcohol down people's throats who are so taste blind because they're that drunk. They, they wouldn't know what they were drinking from one to another. But that one in Ramsey Hall, I was really, really impressed with. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely do that one again. And we're allowed to sell direct from that as well. So we went with a car where basically the back wheels were right down on the ground and the front wheels were coming off the floor. And we went home with next to nothing. So that was, that was really good. But if anybody's ever coming across the water, fish is one to look at. That's for sure. Well, our, the next trip that we're taking with uh, Rascal and Thorne, the, the tour company that we just did, this first trip, you know, we're building these tours around the movie. So the first yeah. tour was on Isla. The second tour is Bayside and Highlands. And we're, we purposely pick dates to begin. The tour begins the day the spirit of Bayside ends, which I've never been to. So uh, I, I've been as a, just as a guest. Uh, um, which is really good, you know, just as a as a whiskey fan. Uh, yeah. It's lovely to do that now and again. And unfortunately, when you spend all your time in the business, you don't really have a lot of opportunity to go and do these things for fun anymore. Everything is just work-related all the time. But it's lovely just to take your drummer hat off and just go as an ordinary punter to these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, hopefully nobody recognizes you, nobody knows who you are. You, you float in under the radar and you enjoy your day. Well, uh, that's that's hard, easier said than done for me. Uh, yes. Of my I, size. You're, you're, in fairness, mate, you're, you're bigger mm-hmm. than the air. So, I, um, I it's no easy, Greg. Uh, the, uh, but um, one of the things that is cool, like we just did this trip, you know, in June and I was with the, the tour group and I was the sort of whiskey person on the tour group, but within the group to, to these distilleries, especially the, the ones, people who didn't know me, I was just on my first whiskey tour, you know, and it was, yeah. it was interesting to sort of see, uh, it, it was fun and, and I liked it. And I'm looking forward to doing it on, on, at the space side too, because we've actually, this time we're going to do some other historical stuff too. We've got a day at Culloden, uh, some, some other stuff too. It's quite an emotional place. Uh, I've been, I, yeah, I've been there once before with my wife, but uh, um, not in a group. And um, so uh, we have a question for you from, or for both of us, maybe I guess from Graham, which is, how many distilleries do you think Isla can accommodate? Uh, about three less than it's already got. If I'm honest with you, uh, there have been. Well, what have we got at the moment? You've got uh, Sekinders is getting built. Uh, yep. You've got Gart Begg are back on now. Yeah. Uh, so that started again. Ian McLeod's are building just across from the airport. So there's another three. You've got Port Ellen coming back online. So that will give us what? 14, 15 distilleries? Yeah. Now, I, the last couple of times I've been across, I've nipped down to see David Brody down at um, Bonahaven. Uh, and oh. I saw to catch up and have a wee chat, and we'll end up in in the pub in Bowmore having a few beers. Uh, but the, the last couple of times I've been down, the well, that, this is the problem: it's water supply. You know, they they literally have dry spells where they've just got to stop because there's no water. Now, even when from what I was told, don't, don't hold me to this. But I was told that initially when Sikinder had put his plans in for his distillery, part of it included a desalination plan so they could use seawater because water is so scarce. Now, you know, when you're using 100 litres of water to create one litre of whiskey, by the time you're using coolant waters and all these kind of things, Mm -hmm. that's a hell of a strain on a tiny wee island. And the thing I don't understand is the fact that literally right across the water sits Campbelltown and next to nobody's batting an eye. But okay, it's changing now. There are three distilleries planned for Campbelltown. So Campbelltown is reawakening, which is lovely to see because it, it really should do. But I love the size of it. it. It just can't support the amount that's going on. I mean, even with some of these new plants, 
part and parcel of it is they've got to put housing into the distillery build because there's nowhere for people to stay. Yeah. Uh, I just think they're putting far too heavy a strain on what is a very fragile kind of infrastructure in that area. That, well, I wasn't going to say it, but now I've had two drams and I'm going to say it. That is what this project I'm working on with Rab McAkern is about. About, oh, nice balance, about life balance in the Hebrides. And, um, and it, you know, because the roads, I mean, he talked about it. The, the roads on Isla are not built to handle the trucks that they currently handle oh. all the time. They're, and, and they're built on peat fields, so many of them, and they're just not even capable of being built that way. And, they, and um, you know, it's funny, though. Uh, I, and rather than give you my own answer, which would be based on conjecture anyway, but I will tell you, someone, when I was just on Isla, asked Jim. I was with the, the tour group we took to Isla. I, I meant to surprise everybody with a surprise appearance from Jim, except Jim showed up 10 minutes early, and by the time I walked out of the building, he was already posing for photos with everyone. That seems like but, but he was asked, how many distilleries do you think there'll be on Isla when it's all said and done? And he said, uh, 10 or 11. And someone said, but there's already been more than that uh, given approval. And he said, approval's not built. And he said, I didn't say the number won't go up before it goes back down. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he's right with that. I, I, and there's only... The, the, the beauty with Isla Whiskies are they are unique. Now, if you keep creating more and more and more and more Isla Whiskies, where's the fun? You know, you don't have that uniqueness anymore. You've, mm -hmm. had, you've got this crazy amount coming out from Isla. And this is before all the new ones come on. You know, I just think it's losing its way. And I think that the classic distilleries that have stood there and, you know, okay, Arnavo's a stunning distillery with a beautiful view. And I think they'll probably do a brilliant job. But let's, let's stop where we are now. That, that's enough's enough. And allow it to have that special place in the Scotch whisky world without huge, huge amounts constantly coming off of that island. Because yeah. all you're really going to do is ruin the special aspect of what it is. And Mark, well, I see, you know, I, and I see Mark Pruitt said, how long will it take to build the infrastructure to support the additional tourism? I, I don't think anyone knows because they're not doing it. I mean, that's the weird thing is that... No, they're not. There's no more, you know, they, they should probably have a separate ferry at this point for just the whiskey cargo as opposed to the, you know, but I'm not here to judge. I don't know enough, but I, but I, you know, I do see it. I do see it that it's, it's, the, the scales are out of balance right now. Oh, very yeah. much. Um, I mean, to a degree, you know, the, the people of Isla are massively benefiting from it because it brings a huge amount of money to the island. But something's got to give at some stage. Mm -hmm. And the, the big problem is the water. You know, anything else you can bring across, but you need the water. And if it's not well, there... It, it was... Well, when I was there in June, a lot of the distilleries had stopped producing because it was there was a bit of mini drought there. And then they, they were... Bamor was on their last match while we were there. They were going to stop. And I think Brooklady moved their silent season up a week because they were... The water was so low, they figured just move it up. Yeah. So... Um, Perfect sense. And then, of course, yeah, Graham says about the the, the malts from Port Ellen, and yeah. I know Brooklady's building a floor malting, but that's only for that's not even going to be a hundred percent of Brooklady. It's going to be a very small percentage of what they can produce. So it, yeah, I, I think it will probably be along the lines of what you've got with some like Volvani, where they've got their maltings there, but it's only a fraction of what they actually need. Uh, I think it's more from a tourist perspective rather than anything else, and you well, can go of using your own peat and say week of peat or whatever. Well, I think with Brooklady, it's because they do the uh, of a Brooklady and an Octomore and a Port Charlotte. There is an Isla only version, and that way, the, that way, the barley never leaves the island until it's in a yeah, bottle. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. right now it has to go back to the mainland and back, and so that's you know that's only good. the Isla barley will be the ones they're going to do it with. But yeah, I, I um, think the on the question of peat, I think we should be all right with that. I know that we have. There's been legislation passed over here that um, peat can no longer be used for things like um, garden centres, where you used to buy bags of peat for, for flowers and whatnot. But there was special dispensation given both to the whisky industry and to crofters who still cut the peats and use them as fuel. Um, and all 
my family for years and years. That's the only fuel source they had. Uh, and the peat banks are very well looked after. They're lovingly cared for. Obviously, it's a finite resource. But I think there is a, there's enough peat on Isla that can last them another millennia. So, well, um, do you, do you know Ben Shakespeare? I know the name because he a... wouldn't know that name. <laughs> He's he, well. I gotta tell you, I was I was teasing Ben about this. I was like, you know, you're not keeping up the family name. <laughs> you're doing you're doing well, but you're not keeping up the family name. You're gonna have to step it up a notch. He's a photographer on Isla, and he's a great guy. And um, he was telling me that Lafroy actually has been doing some really interesting experiments on how better to cut peat sustainably. And I know the most obvious one is not cutting the top layer because that yeah. helps keep it sealed in. And they, they, I guess they've developed a special sort of uh, cutting implement, not like a peat cutter, but like a, an automated one that they will it literally will lift it up, cut it out, and put it back down all in one past that and he he was filming it or or photographing i, photograph I wish it. someone had invented that when i was a boy because it's bloody back-breaking work <laughs> i'll tell you it's murder um these things you got to remember when we're cutting these out of the ground they are soaking wet so it weighs a ton uh but yeah i would have loved one of those when i was a kid that's for <laughs> sure uh most important question we've been asked today Kenny, can you sing like David Brody? I will tell you this. I, I don't know. I've heard both of them sing. Kenny was singing when I met him, or well, shortly after I met him. I have a video of Kenny singing Flower of Scotland to a room full of 300 Germans. Everybody has um, a of me singing at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> there is a... Yeah, I'll tell you the story of how I ended up getting harangued into singing. So my very first ever international whiskey festival we're in Belgium, in Ghent, one of my favourite cities to go to, lovely place. And uh, at the end of the night, Victoria had come with me, and we're all sitting with one of the big uh, Belgian whiskey clubs. There were a few other folk, Ian McWilliams from Glenfarclas, Big Shelton was there, a few of the other guys. And Victoria kind of looks at her watch, and ah, that's 12 o'clock, that's about bedtime. And I was like a wee child, I was like, oh. I'm having fun. She went, oh, no, 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 no. You're the new boy. You're staying out to play. I'm going to bed. I'm like, am I? She went, yeah. <laughs> Make sure you don't come in at six in the morning. I'm like, right, okay, no problem. And away she goes. So a couple of minutes later, I'm sitting playing on my phone, talking to my sons about football. And all I hear is, ooh. I'm like, what? There's a woman just walked past you, big man, seriously giving you the eye. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife's out the door two minutes and you're starting winding me up. I'm not taking you on. Back to my phone. A couple of minutes later. Ooh. I'm like, what is it? She just walked past you. Still giving you the eye, mate. And I looked and right enough, really attractive woman in a green dress staring at me. I thought, well, that's nice. Just proves I'm not dead yet. That's good. And a couple of minutes later, a wee guy comes round the corner who's obviously fallen straight off a of 1973 big kipper tie, sweep over here, dude. He's looking around. I'm wearing a kilt and Ian McWilliams is wearing a kilt. He sees Ian and he goes and do 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 do. And all I can hear Ian saying is, no, 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 no. I can't do that, no. I can't. But he can. And the wee guy goes, wonderful, and vanishes. And the table falls silent. I'm like, what is it now? I'm like, Ian, who's that wee guy? Ah, that wee guy's the husband of the girl in the green dress. And I thought, oh. And, and all I can hear is Ian saying, I can't, but he can't. And you do not want to know the images that are flashing through my brain. I'm going, what the hell did he just ask you? Ah, well, his wife saw a guy in a kilt and she really wants him to sing her a Scottish song. I thought, oh, thank God for that. I thought, and you said? Well, I said, I couldn't, but you can. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I had to stand up at my table and sing. And obviously, Flower of Scotland was the only thing I could remember all the words to. Shilton Almeida hiding in the corner, videoed the whole damn thing. The next day at work, sold it to Victoria 
for a glass of whiskey. So she had the video, I was like, ah, and it went, it, from there on in, it went rampant right the way through. Wow. Well, then I should have, I didn't sell mine, but I have a video of you in, you know, at the, at the Jim McEwen and friends, uh, that was, shot, shot on three cameras. That was crazy. That was the best <laughs> master class. I, I, what was that, 300 people or something crazy like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a selfie on stage. And behind me, it looks like we've been at a football match, not a whiskey tasting. But what <laughs> a laugh that was. And, ah, yes, it's easy enough to sing a song, you know. So long as I'm not being judged on it, you know, I'm certainly not going to give up whiskey and take up professional singing anytime soon. That's for sure. Well, uh, James DiGiulio said, uh, David makes Boona better. Um yeah, David's singing. I, you know, I've, I, I've, I've done, I've done David's Warehouse Nine tastings a couple times, but he's never sung during them. I just know he is well, a singer. The last time I did a Warehouse Nine with David, we ended up just talking about school because the two of us went to school together. Uh, huh. He's a few years older than me, but it was a, a big international group, and all the conversation was, "Did you have Miss Watson for history?" I did. What a woman she was. Did you get Miss Henry? Oh, she was a nightmare. Yes, yeah, she was. And we're just talking about teachers that we had. And everyone else is going, what the hell's going on here? Well, oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> Back to whiskey. Uh, <laughs> Dave, David's a brilliant character. Absolutely brilliant lad. It's funny because on our tour, we, we did the Warehouse 9 tasting in June. And I'd done it before. And I told everyone at the tour company, I said, don't just book the Warehouse 9 tasting. Ask for David. And yeah, yeah, they did. They did, and it worked out. And then afterwards, they came to me, and they were like, "Oh, I totally get that. Like he, he's in his element, you know." Oh, that's that's a creature in his natural habitat. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, his his God. his business card now says David Brody, aging tour guide. Um, that? Yeah, <laughs> that's what he made. That's what he told me anyway. I don't know if accurate. it does. That's accurate. <laughs> I'll give him that. <laughs> um. Well, you know, it's funny. I say this all the time, but uh, this hour has flown by. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm I really... Believe, I've been watching. I'm talking to you and watching my battery at the same time. And you were 100% right, Greg. It's now, it started going up again. I thought, oh, yes, we're going to get to the end. Uh, but no, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's always a... When you and me have a chat, it can go on for days. And I'll just pass like that. Well, I want to. Next time I get to talk to you, I want to talk about Rukesi. Yeah, no bother at all. That's that's where I lived when I lived in Glasgow. Yeah. Which which prompted every every Glaswegian we met said, "Why would they put exchange students in Rukesi?" Tell you what, that's it's an interesting part of Glasgow. Yeah, um, Roy Duff said, "Oh, well, he, he, how did he word it? It was perfect." He said, "Well, you've gotten yourself a thicker slice of Glasgow there." A hundred percent right. Yeah, um, what sand all. Uh, an interesting place. It's the sort of place um, you don't walk through, you run through. Well, it's funny. People kept warning us. And then the day we got there, like a bunch of kids, a bunch of little suit wearing kids in the, in the housing oh, estate came up to us. And, and I thought, oh, here it is. And you know what they asked me? The first thing they asked me? Well, the first thing they asked me is, are you an American? Said, yes. Do you know Eddie Murphy? That was... This, <laughs> that was <laughs> Of course. No, I don't. Sorry, sorry, I don't. But I'll, I'll, I'll try harder. See that, um, I must say that we do get that, especially from like when tourists come over from the states. They'll go. I've got a friend. You must know them. Well, like, oh, there's five and a half million of us. How, how must I know them? But no, no, you must know them. And sometimes, bizarrely, I've had it once. And like, oh, you're from Lewis. Oh yeah, it's the, the family home and stuff. All right, you'll know this guy. And I thought, here we go. And whoever, I can't remember who, oh, it was Ian George. They came away with a name. And I'm like, he's actually my second cousin. Yeah, I do know him. And I'm like, oh, damn, I've just disproved this. But yeah, small world. Well, I don't know Eddie Murphy. Know to Eddie this Murphy. day, I've I've failed. I've failed it. I do not know Eddie Murphy. But why I even bother talking to you, I do not know. <laughs> What's the point? If you can't introduce me to Eddie Murphy, you're no good to me. Um, well, I will see you in a few months, my friend, uh, if not sooner. Yeah. And, but when you come here, we'll do some, we'll do some fun stuff. We'll, we'll, I would we'll, love we'll, 
we can also do some fun whiskey stuff all over LA with uh, the whiskey scene here. The whiskey clubs here would all be thrilled to pour some Dremore. Sounds incredible, mate. And we will get there at some stage, that's a promise. But uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, an absolute pleasure, mate. Oh, always, man. Thank you. Thanks so much for spending part of your Friday with me, buddy. More than Cheers. welcome, mate. I'm on Iron Brew because I'm suffering a bit after last night's overindulgence. Slanchin. Slanchin. <laughs>